Hi there. So today I'm going to be looking about uh, around ideas of the, the urban environment, our sense of place, our sense of being and how these things connect. And also how we might go around as creative writers looking at ways of disrupting those uh, the structures that are there and, and playing with them. Um, and as I do this, I'm going to be touching on a couple of really interesting and important theories. Uh, number one. Uh, environmental psychology and that um, attempts to link our psychological well-being with uh, and our cultural identification with the sort of systems and signs that exist in individual locations and I'm also going to be talking about psychogeography uh, that kind of sets out series of playful instructions that allows us to investigate and experience our environment on our own terms um, and also uh, to experience our our place within those environments on our own terms so let's go <clears throat> a lot of work has already been done in the field of environmental psychology in terms of the way our formation of identity is linked to our sense of place in their article place and identity process Claire Twigler-Ross and David L. Ouzel use the model that identity should be conceptualised in the terms of a biological organism moving through time, which develops through the accommodation, assimilation and evaluation of the social world, to quote from their article. It is in some ways a Freudian model, but without the focus on the bodily. They're arguing um, that identity is formed, at least in part, through a series of drives and acts that either attach or distance themselves uh, or distance the subject from their environments. And that essentially creates a sense of place. They argue that, quote, distinctiveness summarises a lifestyle and establishes that person as having a specific type of relationship with his or her home environment, which is clearly distinct from any other type of relationship. People use place identification in order to distinguish themselves from others. In this sense, place functions in a similar way to a social category, and therefore place identifications can be thought of as comparable to social identifications. So what this equates to is that our relationship with and our connectedness to our hometowns, our housing estates, the landmarks and the histories that make up the locale are as fundamental to our sense of self and our sense of identity as gender, class, race, sexuality. So our sense of place is what marks us out as individual and also what marks us out as kind of part of a pack. Now, Twiggler Ross and Uzzel break this down into two separate but equally important paths in the process of sort of establishing this sense of place. There is place referent continuity and place congruent continuity. So place referent continuity is a kind of uh, connection with the things that are specific to uh, your hometown. So the history, the landmarks, uh, the heritage uh, and the things that only can come from there. Um, and that a maintenance of that continuity is really important to us. And then there is also place congruent continuity, which is all about the, the things that are important in terms of location that could be generic. So things like good schools, good uh, railway networks, good uh, jobs, uh, commuting, logistics, things like that, that you could quite easily pick up and move to another place. So they're not site specific, uh, but are equally as important to our sense of self. <clears throat> so um, the subject then defines themselves in relation to a place because of the cultural or personal current that that place exudes in some way. And they argue that the continuity of that current, be it uh, a present one or a legacy, um, is fundamental to us and to our well-being because they argue that having control or not over the maintenance of that 
site specific continuity uh, is important for our psychological well being. And they argue that unwanted and personally uncontrollable change in a physical environment can result to uh, grief or loss. And a good example of this is sort of post-industrial towns where quite a lot of the culture and the sense of community and sense of identity was tied up with industrial labour and uh, the offshoots that that uh, and the implications that that have on a community. And uh, obviously, quite a lot of that has now disappeared in Britain. <clears throat> Moving on, in his Jacksonville TEDx talk, where am I? The power of uniqueness. Ed McMahon quotes the writer Wallace Stegner, who argued, if you don't know where you are, you don't know who you are. McMahon goes on to provide a fascinating lecture on the psychological, political and economic benefits of preserving this sense of place. And he says that place is more than just a spot on the map. Place is what makes your hometown different from my hometown. But more importantly, I, I believe, sense of place is explicitly that which makes our physical surroundings worth caring about. Using various examples of cared for and uncared for places, he makes a case for the ways in which local history and culture benefit areas in terms of economics and investment, as well as um, as well as in terms of being and uh, communal connection. So he focuses on areas of historical significance, suggesting another thing that affects value and sense of place is the presence or absence of historic buildings and neighbourhoods. It's about physically connecting people to the past. It's about telling you who you are and where you came from. And this echoes the environmental psychologists who think that heritage acts as a kind of anchor for a sense of place, as well as one that kind of underpins identity or self. Um, McMahon calls for the protection and conservation of the cultural and the historical, not just so that they remain, but also so that they might properly stand out and so that they hold the full potential of their significance. For him, it's not good enough just to have a monument to something or someone if the area around it doesn't allow for its appreciation. Um, Mahan carries on, quote, it's not because we can't plant new trees and build new buildings. It's because, I believe, our sense of identity and well-being is tied in a very profound way to special buildings and places and views. These places are invested with rich symbolic importance that contributes to our sense of identity and well-being in a way no less fundamental than religion, our language, our culture. It's not just about the economy of this state, it's about the psychology of this state as well. Now, like so many arguments, this leads us to Michel Foucault. So the environmental psychologists suggest that our sense of place, be it attachment or detachment, is based around uh, a system of symbols that organise the cultural identity and the demographic of place. And Foucault talks about power in terms of regimes of truth. Now, I'm uh, not using the term power in any sort of neo-Marxist sense here. It's not about oppression it's not about victim and oppressor. Uh, it's about uh, power being seen as um, something that disperses its way throughout society. So it's more about ideas and ideals that, um, that work their way into our sense of the world. <clears throat> and uh, this is what Foucault calls regimes of truth. So it's not necessarily an act or a thing that has one thing over another, but it becomes a set of and a series uh, of ideas that are dispersed throughout society. And I think we can argue that space and property and the imagined ownership of these places uh, form part of these structures of power. Now, Foucault uh, used um, quite often 
talks about this in terms of power and knowledge. And he argues that there's a kind of cyclical nature between power and knowledge where one thing is constantly reinforcing the other and it moves on and on and on. And if we think about that model and replace the words power and knowledge with identity and place, you might start to think about the way that we could use a Foucauldian model in terms of this environmental psychology. In this sense, in this sense, then, we understand the urban environment and our environment and our locations in the way that we engage with its power. We go to the central library and we behave and adapt to that space because of the rules that we as a collective organise around that place. And the same can be said of the supermarket, the way we walk to work, the routes we travel through cities, the way the shops, the advertising boards, the benches and the offices dictate various ways of being to us. Kind of unspoken rules, I suppose. This place is, is a place to shop. This place is a place to rest. This place is a place to work. So the environmental psychologists argue that these structures of power or these streams of power and the way the city is built through these markers of place in turn affect the way that we experience place and the way that we see ourselves within that location. <clears throat> so we might argue that these things could be easily broken, even through just recognising that those power structures are in play. And I think that if we could look to change how these places are experienced, um, we could look at redefining the power of a place. And we can do this through uh, reconsidering our environments, reconsidering our urban environments through creative practices. <clears throat> now, a good example of how this works in real terms is through the street art scene or graffiti. In their book about graffiti, uh, Clanton and Hubner suggest that artists challenge and adopt civic spatial rules to their own benefit by adapting and manipulating rather than accepting or refusing the existing spatial system. It is the users who are exploring and defining new urban territories. So in this way, graffiti is not just a decoration or eyesore. It's an act of turning an urban environment, say an underpass or a walkthrough, into a gallery. In another of their books, Clanton and Ehman call it an attempt at subverting or super, superimposing on the symbol systems we call cities. Now, a simple leap from Foucault's ideas on power and the environmental psychologists and how the, this sense of place is dispersed uh, is a leap towards psychogeography. Now, this was a term that was defined by Guy Dubois, who saw it as the study of the specific effects of the geographical environment, consciously organised or not, on the emotional behaviour of individuals. And psychogeography focuses on urban wandering, what de Boer defined as derive, or uh, a simple translation would be drifting. <clears throat> and it's the imaginative reworking of the city, the otherworldly sense of spirit of place, the unexpected insights and juxtapositions created by aimless drifting, the new ways of experiencing familiar surroundings. Um, in his Pocket Essentials to Psychogeography, Merlin Coverley says, the city must be rebuilt upon new principles that replace our mundane and sterile experiences. And he argues that the way that this can be done is through this urban wandering, through this drifting. And he said that we need to become like Blake, one who remakes the city in accordance with his own imagination that seeks to overthrow the established order of the day. Now, obviously, these guys are kind of coming from a neo-Marxist uh, postmodern uh, agenda. But even if you think in your everyday lives that you sort of navigate the same paths, you drive the same way to work and to school and whatnot, um, that there is an argument to suggest that we've kind of become blinkered around our sense of self, uh, the way that self and place connect 
Uh, and uh, a way of lifting those blinkers is to deliberately get lost and to drift aimlessly. Now, you might see this as kind of taking a pick and mix approach into looking at our sense of place, our sense of space and history and kind of drawing conclusions on how it affects community uh, and how it might be challenged. <clears throat> uh, the poet Ian Duhigg has written about this um, and this challenging of space structures. And he argues in favour of this idea of drifting. He says, I want to put a word in for pointless travelling without landmarks. It can be a messy process, but poetry is messy and there are invaluable things to be found in the dark that you could not discover in any other way. You have wonder and surprise to gain and nothing to lose but your certainties. So if we accept that psychogeography works, then isn't it just as plausible to be a psychohistorian, a psychosociologist? essentially giving ourselves the power to rewrite our histories and our links with community. Now, fundamentally, we might be approaching an instinctual rather than an intellectual approach to assessing who we are and where we're from. And this is problematic because it might lead to unsubstantiated intellectual leaping. However, I think that this subjective act can also allow for new connections and new possibilities to discuss identity and place. Now, in terms of my own argument here, I'm suggesting several things. That the creative writer has the potential to unlock previously unseen things within a community or a location by adopting a drift attitude to their research and their relationship with place. Because drifting allows us to understand and to imagine our environment in new ways which then offers new possibilities in perception. I also think that drifting and the recording of it is an act of destabilizing the kind of prescribed notions or those blinkered notions we have of our place. And that this destabilizing can give rise uh, to voices that might have previously been unheard. And then finally, that we uh, that this pick and mix approach provides a legitimate route to connect history, politics, geographical data that were previously unconnected. Um, and I also think there's a further political reasoning at play here or a socio-political reasoning at play. Uh, what what might we make of spaces within our everyday worlds that are overlooked or misunderstood? Can an engagement with the overlooked enhance our understanding of our environments? So every day we might pass by the canals of Birmingham, go past places of demolition or places of redevelopment, all of which are important markers of the, the urban landscape. How often do you stop and observe this? And if you do stop, what might, what might that do to our understanding of culture, community, and the spaces and places that you inhabit. Um, when John Rogers, who's a, a filmmaker, uh, spoke about his film, The London Perambulator, he said, quote, I think these places need to be celebrated. And I think we need to challenge these traditional ideas of heritage because they're misplaced and it's lazy. In any town, they all sort of go, oh, look at this building. It's Georgian. But most people that live in those places don't ever have any engagement with those buildings, whereas they do have an engagement with some sort of piss stench bus stop on the A40, which has so much narrative in it and so much heritage within its framework that we should celebrate them more. So. Psychogeography or deep topography, as some of them uh, like to be called, um, kind of embraces this sense of exploring the overlooked. So it's not just about drifting and getting lost. It's about deliberately finding places that you might not have looked at, going off the beaten track to look at uh, things that are off kilter, I suppose, or in the shadows. Um one of the names that always comes out when we think about psychogeography and uh, deep topography is Ian Sinclair. 
Uh, and he in particular talks about drifting and deliberately seeking out overlooked places um, as a way of kind of working towards an idiosyncratic vision of sense or sense of place. And he kind of sees these acts as a form of poetics as well. Um, in a, a recent lecture, or relatively recent lecture at De Montford University, uh, Sinclair spoke about his walk around the whole of the M25 and its relationship to a development of a creative process. And he calls it a fugue uh, and a psychic, psychic commando course, suggesting that there's a sense of possession. There's a sense of pilgrimage. There's a sense of allowing place to pour through you and channel itself through you until you achieve a voice. You walk out of yourself in the way John Clare, the poet, talked of walking out of his knowledge. His knowledge was of this very specific locale. In a sense, the walk is a poem. That energy that promotes you into that is a way of dealing with these psychological pressures, pressures of history and territory that all become resolved through the physical act of finding the right form of writing. So what Sinclair is also suggesting here is not only that we gain a deeper and individualistic view of the urban world, um, we can use this sense of drifting or deliberately getting lost as a way of forming a creative process and practice. So what you can do in your everyday lives to kind of encourage this creative thought is uh, travel a different route home each day. Think to yourself, I've never been down that road. I'll go down it. Deliberately get yourself lost. And it's about deliberately and actively observing and engaging with sites that you knew were there but hadn't paid attention to. Um, and keep notes, make journals, and then produce some kind of writing based on those experiences. Because when you're doing that, what you're doing is taking part in a psychogeographical process. And I'll leave today's talk uh, with a quote from uh, the poet and the geographer, uh, Tim Creswell. Uh, and he's also a sort of expert in mobility and sense of place and writing about location specifically. And he says, location, location that is simply a point, a dot on a map, if you like, becomes a rich, meaningful set of ideas as well as a location. Thanks for listening.